one of the most inspirational, forward-looking development meetings ever to take place in Galway in the modern era was organised in September 2021 by the Galway National Park City Initiative for the benefit of the councillors and officials of Galway City Council. Chaired by Mihal Okaneja, ex-director of the Environmental Protection Agency, and formally launched by Mayor Colette Connolly with the champions of the Galway National Park City in attendance, presentations were made by an array of world-renowned London-based developers, as well as a senior official at Cardiff Council, the chief executive of World Urban Parks and former senior government official in Australia, a former European Union official recently involved in the development of the Green Deal, and the founder of the London National Park City. All these experienced and highly respected individuals spoke of their support of the National Park City designation and the benefits that it could bring Galway. First of all, I'd like to call on Mayor Colette Connolly from an illustrious, hard-working family uh, and a great mayor to say a few words. Gormagat Colette. Gormagat, Miha. Okay, Marvera er kahar nagaliva bwatliom falcha rov a karov he gan okoj special to show er margin. As mayor of Galway City, I am delighted to welcome you all here to the first workshop regarding the proposal of the designation of a national park city status for Galway. It's a very special occasion, and we have participants who are taking part from London, Cardiff, Brussels, and Melbourne giving their very valuable time and experiences to Galway City Council on the issue of what a National Park City designation will actually mean for Galway and how it can benefit the social, health and educational well-being of its citizens, boost jobs, restore biodiversity and tackle climate change and promote sustainable development. Like other cities worldwide, we need to reimagine our cities. We need to undergo a cultural shift towards development and develop the necessary collective partnership approach towards the challenges that we all face. The Galway National Park City designation could be a vehicle towards achieving this, ne this necessary unity of purpose. It has Already, it has already garnered a high level of support from a wide strata of local society, with champions drawn from business cooperations, small businesses, local communities, the medical profession, teachers, third level science researchers, engineers, youth, artists, walking and cycling advocacy, uh, environmentalists, and the asylum seekers community. With the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, acting as its patron and Ireland's most well-known environmental, environmentalist, Duncan Stewart, as its national champion. And Catherine Tierney, uh, until recently, a policy coordinator at the Directorate General Environment of the European Commission, its European champion. So, Gunnairi Antoliev Gullier. So, all the best of luck to you this morning. I'm looking forward to hearing the presentations. Slán. Slán. Gormá, good collect. And next we're going to introduce Daniel Raven Ellison, founder of the National City Park in London, and who's going to talk about the experiences of London and your National Park City there, and the work that he's been involved in since 2013, in the campaign to make London the first National Park City in the world, and the support that it's got. And I think that Daniel will also show a short video. So Daniel, over to you, and you're very welcome. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be with you all today to share with you some of our experiences and work around the London National Park City and continued work around the ambition for those national park cities around the world. And there were sort of campaigns bubbling away in cities such as Berlin, Tokyo, Manila, and Adelaide, as Neil will talk briefly about, uh, Calgary, uh, Sacramento, and so on. I think a key insight for me around this is that wherever you are in the world, wherever we are as urban populations around the world, despite the diversity that's embedded and should be celebrated, we actually have many shared anxieties around the climate emergency, the health emergency, 
many of our economies around housing crises. And while there are very many disparate ideas in the world that, that pull people apart at the moment, I think the National Park City is a positive vision for the future that can actually bring people together in a really exciting and compelling way. So I've been to Galway a few times. I absolutely love Galway, but I'm going to talk primarily about my city, London, where um, I've lived for many years. And so when I talk about the London National Park City in that context, in this sort of elevator, um, I'd like to see you to sort of draw the parallels with your own city as well as, as I go through that. Um, so my background um, is I'm a former geography teacher. I'm a National Geographic explorer um, and have worked on the London National Park City campaign for the last seven years plus. And are now working through the National Park City Foundation with uh, Neil McCarthy, who's on the call at World Urban Parks, as well as Salzburg Global Seminar on supporting and helping people in other cities around the world follow uh, on the journey that London's gone on in one way or another. So I'm going to take you through a sort of quite a quick 15 minute uh, presentation. And then I think the, the main purpose of this meeting is to talk about some of the issues and anxieties and concerns around this very interesting tension between you know, the fact that we all want to have a better environment, live in greener, healthier, wilder, cooler cities, um, but we also need to have housing and development for people to live in, because after all, we live in cities and we need to protect cities as cities as well. So that's going to be the main driver, I think, for much of the discussion. And straight off the back of my presentation, um, I've got a short video of four people um, who are going to sort of say a few words about that particular issue. So I'm just going to share my screen now. So what if Galway was a national park city? What a fabulous uh, possibility for the future of Galway. When people think of national parks, the idea of a city being a national park might seem like almost like a ridiculous idea to some people. It can almost seem like the two opposites of what a national park is and what a, a city is. Um, but what I want to do to start with is just sort of help you get your head around that idea if you're not quite bought into how a city could be this new kind of national park. So when you look at national parks around the world, there are all kinds of habitats and environments, these landscape scale environments like here, Banff National Park in Canada, or Death Valley here in the United States, or here looking at the Connemara. And when you look at this family of national parks around the world, they represent every single type of major internationally recognized habitat and landscape that you can imagine, apart from the world's fastest growing habitat, which is urban areas. And it's slightly counterintuitive the way that many of us were brought up, but actually urban areas can be more biodiverse and more bioabundant than many of the world's national parks, including Banff, including um, um, Death Valley, including the Connemara. Cities can be far more biodiverse. And actually London um, in the UK's context is arguably the most bi biologically diverse region of the UK with about 15,000 species of wildlife in the greater London area. To put it into context, according to National Parks for Ireland, there's only about a thousand more species across the um, island's national parks. So three key reasons why I think it makes sense to think of cities as this potential of becoming national park cities, this new kind of national park, set to the backdrop of London here and this sort of rich mosaic of ecology and habitats finding its way through the city towards the River Thames there. So firstly, I think that it's vital that we recognize that urban life is not worth less than rural life. This peregrine falcon here in Chicago is just as valuable as the peregrine falcons in Yosemite National Park or the Peak District National Park um, here um, in England. And actually there are more breeding pairs of peregrine falcon in London than there are in either of those two national parks. Just because people or wildlife is in an urban context, it's not worth less. And I think an idea that it is, is a harmful idea. Secondly, the purpose of a national park is to protect life and to enable people to enjoy themselves in those landscapes and those habitats. We desperately need to protect life in cities. We need to make life better in cities. So why not harness this fantastic idea uh, for urban environments? And finally, you know, I love going for a hike in the desert or a rainforest or, or across the moorland, but cities are enjoyable too. I think some of the best hiking and outdoor activities you can do is in urban areas. And actually it's in urban areas where most people are engaging with nature on a day-to-day -day basis as well. So we started playing around this question, um, tens, then hundreds, then thousands of us, this idea, what if we made London a national park city? And when you look at this image that I took looking across Barbican, across St. Paul's towards central London, that might seem like a ridiculous idea. And many people will have this very gray concrete experience of London. 
But the reality is that London is one of the greenest cities in the world. Galway is a very green city too. Nearly half of London is physically green um, and blue. There are 1600 sites of importance for nature conservation, three uh, national nature reserves, four UNESCO World Heritage sites. Um, about a quarter of London is gardens. There are 3000 uh, parks. So this map here shows you this sort of great diversity of green spaces that are um, interconnected in all kinds of different ways. But when we look at it from the policy context, this is a document that was developed by the mayor of London called the All London Green Grid. And it's basically supplementary planning to the London plan, the big document that governs the future of planning and development in London. Um, looking at this, it's suggesting ways to make the city greener and wilder, to be better at tackling issues like flooding and improving air quality and connecting children to nature for their mental health and their well-being. But the second or third paragraph into this document, they say that they are not gonna include private land within, uh, within their ideas, within their plans. And this is a common shortfall of, of public policy making where the focus of government is very much on where government has power immediately through the land it owns or can control, but not recognizing the fact that if quarter of London is gardens, but half those gardens are paved over, then how can we talk, be talking properly about a pollinator strategy or talking about reducing flooding if we're not talking about those private spaces? And if we want to increase tree canopy cover, well, 60% of trees in central London and 80% in outer London are in private ownership. So how can we be excluding those spaces as well? So quite clearly what we need is a holistic long-term vision for urban environments, which isn't about segmenting off groups or areas or places in quite a divisive way. It's about seeing the environment for what it is, which is everything, everywhere in one system. So the London National Park City then, what is that? Well, we're a place that you can explore, you can make better, you can make worse. We're a vision, a contested vision for making the city greener, healthier and wilder. It's a movement of people who are working together on those aims. And actually millions of people have been working on making the city greener, healthier and wilder for hundreds of years in London. It's nothing new, but it's asking ways in which we can join up and catalyze action because the demand and need for action is so great. So like I say, it's about making the city greener, healthier, wilder, getting more people outdoors more of the time. Crucially as well, it's about shaping a new identity for London and Londoners. London is famous as a cultural, political and financial centre. It's less well known as an ecological centre, which it truly is. And what might it mean to be a child or a business growing up in a national park city? What different decisions might you make in your daily life and in your ambitions as you go forward? I think identifying where you grow up, where you do your business in um, as a national park city is very compelling for shaping new, ide new ideas uh, for the future. So nine in 10 Londoners, we know through YouGov independent polling, support the vision of the London National Park City. We also know that eight in 10 Londoners want to see uh, uh, the, the mayor and local councils and boroughs doing far more strategically to help make the London National Park City a success. And I would guess that if you were to run a similar poll in Galway, you would find very similar figures as well. So crucially, a national park city is not a national park. In the UK, um, a national park um, has to be a special area that's great for wildlife, great for recreation, that's working to improve the economic and well-being of the local communities. But it also has to be a place that's countryside. And quite clearly, a city is not countryside. And we're not interested in subverting national parks or undermining them or trying to change legislation. So the principle here is to create something new that's inspired by our incredible family of national parks around the world, make it appropriate for the urban environment and grow uh, that, uh, that idea. And when you look at this history of national parks around the world, what you may notice is that there are some urban national parks in the world, um, that are, but all of them are either inside or B-side cities. Um, a great example at the moment is the National Park Service in Canada, uh, where they have the Rouge Urban uh, national Park, and actually uh, that's on the edge of the city, not the city itself, and they're currently investing about 130 million Canadian dollars in developing their urban national park uh, program, but still inside of B-side cities. What's different about what we're doing here is we're saying that the whole conurbation, the whole city, the whole environment, its hinterlands, its main urban core are all included, because after all, if you are a peregrine falcon, or if you're rain, or if you're an otter or a commuter, then you don't recognize the, the relatively arbitrary boundaries sometimes of those uh, 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 administrative boundaries. So we should be thinking ecologically instead. So 
many of you will be very familiar with two models of national park. Firstly, there's the kind of Yogi Bear top-down national park like they have in the United States where they have rangers with guns who can shoot you and the federal government owns all the land. We then have national parks that are deliver delivered in partnership like the ones here in England where essentially there are 400,000 people that already live in our national parks. There's a rich mosaic of different types of land ownership and management and control. And while there's policy in place to help protect the landscapes, actually it is through partnership that most of the best work is done. And then finally, far fewer people in the West tend to be aware of those national parks in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, Brazil, where there are indigenous people who have always lived on the land, often for hundreds or thousands of years, who are recognized as being the people who are best capable of looking after that environment. They're supported by policy to protect those spaces, hopefully, but it's indigenous people. Of course, we can switch out the word indigenous for just people because people in suburban environments can also share stories and wisdom and skills and seeds and ideas to further ways to protect and improve the urban landscape. So any national park, but especially a national park city then, is a combination of these three overlapping pillars, top-down policy, to help make the city greener, healthier and wilder, partnerships to catalyze and spread good practices and action. But crucially, it's the people who make up the, who make the top down policies and the partnerships who have the gardens, who look after the schools, who want their city to be greener, healthier, wilder and cooler, uh, that are obviously absolutely critical to this particular vision. So what makes a national park city different to other ideas out there? Firstly, really importantly, it's about purpose. So we know what a city is roughly for. It's a place where we come together to sleep, sleep, eat, uh, do business, um, and maybe watch Netflix in our free time as well. We know what a national park is for. It's a special place where we have a better relationship with nature, where we can go to enjoy ourselves. So by augmenting the purpose of a national park on top of a city, what we're saying is a city is, yes, it's about work, and it's about playing, it's about sleeping, and it's about watching Netflix, but it's also about enjoying ourselves and having a better relationship with nature. And don't we need to have that? It's about taking a landscape approach, which means that everyone, everything, everywhere is involved. And the name of the game is to drive awareness, to get more people involved in positive ways, to drive forward the mission. But it's the entire landscape, everyone, everywhere. It's forever. It's not an initiative or a project that's here today and gone tomorrow. It will be around and possibly most effective when we're all long and gone. It gives us a language and a way of speaking to each other, both about that purpose, but by tapping into the rich expertise and experiences of our national park services around the world. Finally, crucially, it's about story. Stories we can create for ourselves as individuals, as neighborhoods, as communities, as entire cities about what we're doing together um, on this agenda. So in the London National Park City, we weave stories in all kinds of different ways. And thousands of people are involved, both consciously and subconsciously, both in an aware way and not. We do it in lots of different ways. So for example, we now have 100 London National Park City uh, rangers. Um, and these National Park City rangers um, aren't just people who might pull you know, sheep out of fences or anything like that. They are storytellers, they are artists, they are community organizers, they are experts in uh, rewilding. And they are helping good ideas and practices to spread more quickly through the city. And our ambition is to have one or 2000 National Park City rangers in the future which may seem ambitious and like a lot, but in a city of nearly 10 million people, that makes sense. But what if Galway had a thousand or 2000 volunteer National Park City Rangers? How incredible would that be for the identity and potential of Galway? We do it by organizing big events and fairs to bring people together to break down boundaries, by organizing events where people can speak, by creating newspapers that present evidence ways to make life better through things that individual people can do every day. We teamed up with Loyal Karner, who's a very famous uh, rap artist in Timberland and MTV, to make a documentary about greening the city that actually won an award at Cannes. And this helped to engage more young people with urban uh, greening. We've collaborated with Urban Good, who make these incredible one meter square maps that show London, not as an A to Z of all the streets, but as an incredible green interwoven landscape both showing people where they can explore and how they can explore, but also beginning to knock at the door of hinting of how we could connect up and make the city greener um, as well. We get into newspapers, onto the BBC, into Time Out, weaving this story about the place. And all that has helped to garner a lot of political support with the majority of London's 2000 elected politicians supporting us at the beginning of the campaign and both the Mayor of London and the London Assembly supporting the initiative and actually all the main mayoral candidates leading up to uh, when the National Park City 
uh, was declared, supported this as well from across the different political parties. And the London National Park City is not in London plan in terms of governing how planning is done in the city. It's there as a reference for inspiring development, but it is, for example, here in the mayor's uh, environment strategy, which includes a target to make the majority, well, half of London physically green and blue, a target that cannot be achieved uh, by the mayor on, on his own or councils on their own. It's about business and gardeners and the mayor um, and individual residents all working together. The mayor has people in the mayor's office who work on National Park City um, aims. And a couple of years ago, before the main COVID uh, trauma sort of broke out, we had a big festival that was attended by a very large number of people uh, in central London, which was fantastic. So we like to ask a lot with the National Park City, two questions sort of around what if, what if the city was greener, healthier and wilder, and then follow that up with, well, why not? And I've got hundreds of examples of these, but I just wanted to show you some fun planning ones that we've had from design competitions where people are imagining possibilities. So this is from WATG, the architects, imagining a fleet street in central London made radically more green. Something that people thought looked as a fantastic idea that maybe would never happen pre-COVID, but post-COVID, I think there's real hunger that environments should look far more like this. A shy moxen designed this incredible street for both either future fitting or retrofitting buildings to be as biodiverse um, as possible. And I love this one, which demonstrates how the National Park City is not just about greenness and nature, um, but this is from Farrell's architects who have this idea of creating a vertical common where people can climb up this wall in the city, um, just like they could do in, a, in maybe Yosemite or somewhere like that. And I absolutely love this idea. It seems fantastical, but you know, why not? So what if there was an international family of national park cities? There would actually be a wide range of benefits if there were lots of national park cities around the world of sharing best practices and learning and inspiration. And Brendan has been on many calls with us already learning from people in uh, the Philippines and New Zealand and America, collaborating and thinking about um, how we can drive this agenda forward. A great enrichment both to us, but also I think to Brendan and Galway as well. So there's movements growing around the world and we have something called the Universal Charter for National Park Cities, which sets out some of the key goals about what we're trying to achieve, as well as the definition for a national park city. The work around creating new national park cities in the future is very grassroots, and they looked at very different in different places. In Galway, it started from a very grassroots position, while in Adelaide in Australia, the national park city there is being led by the Minister for Environment for South Australia, with a preset from utilities bills helping to fund that particular effort. And the National Park City Foundation is working with both World Urban Parks and South World Global Seminar on this very important process and assessment for the establishment of new uh, national park cities around the world, which I'm not gonna go through now, but we could dive into at a later date if you wanted to. Key thing I want to say about this is that, that the idea of the assessment is not to award cities where people are, are fortunate enough to have inherited fantastic green spaces and cultures from previous generations. We're far more interested in the energy around how cities will change in the future to be better for people and wildlife um, and to be better places to live. 